Welcome back once again, all you CISSP wannabes. These are the IT Dojo CISSP questions of the day. I am Colin Weaver. Every single day I give you not one, but two questions to ponder and contemplate as you continue your studies. Let's go ahead and jump right in it. All right, question number one today, coming at you from the world of computer forensics. As part of the evidence collection process, a forensics investigator opens a terminal on a, a suspect system and uses that terminal to issue commands to determine the contents of the routing table, the process table, the ARP cache, uh, the resolver cache, and, um, uh, and then he uses his cell phone to go in and take pictures of the output of each one of those uh, that's displaying on the screen. My question to you is, is those actions that that investigator took, uh, which of these is a result of that? All right, first potential on the list is by viewing the data disclosure rules have been violated. Uh, no, uh, th there are questions of accessibility of information if you're talking about computers that contain certain levels of sensitivity of information that the investigator uh, may have some issues with being able to go in and investigate and look at. But in this case, something like taking pictures or screenshots of a, uh, or the contents of a routing table or something like that isn't typically going to be something that violates uh, data disclosure rules. Second item on the list suggests that by running those commands, he has altered the system. And this is absolutely true. This is the answer that you're looking for. Um, if you believe that a system has been involved in a compromise, it is widely regarded and generally accepted that it is unacceptable for you to execute commands on that computer because you can no longer trust anything about what that computer um, says or is doing. How do you know that the terminal that you launched is actually the original terminal and it hasn't been replaced with something else? How do you know that the output that you're seeing isn't stuff that's being modified in some way? And the simple answer is, is that you don't. Therefore, you should not trust the system. If you're going to execute any commands on the system, they should be commands that are executed uh, that are yours that you bring with you that are on a read-only media that you would connect to the system. And this is a rapidly evolving and dynamic field, and exactly what the best practices are may change from time to time, but the one thing that's definitely going to be a truism is that interacting with the system and going in and typing commands with reckless abandon the way that this particular person did is a big party foul, so you don't want to do that. The third option on the list suggested that chain of custody had been broken. Uh, no, type in commands, whether that you did it wrong or not, doesn't really break chain of custody. It might damage the evidence and it might cause you some issues with future admissibility or the veracity of the evidence, but it's not gonna actually go in and break chain of custody. The fourth item on the list says that photos taken of, photos taken of what is displayed on the screen are not considered to be um, authentic. Um, that is not necessarily true. I'm not an attorney and I can't argue all the legal implications of that, but um, it's, and again, another one of these things that's widely regarded as being a smart play is that if there is something on a screen, um, you know that it's not gonna be there forever, so take a picture of it so that you can reference back to it later on. Um, I, I can't comment in detail on the admissibility of such things. Maybe somebody out there who's a legal expert in this wants to throw their comments down the bottom and that would be super cool, but, uh, but that is not the right answer in this scenario. And then the last item on the list, which is also not right, says that commands should only be executed on this system through a remotely established SSH connection. Uh, no, that sounds fancy because you're like, ooh, SSH, there's encryption there. So somehow that makes it more secure. That couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, you're establishing yet another connection to the system, which is changing the system. And uh, we, we want to have the system change as little as possible, um, keeping in mind that if you do nothing, the system changes. If you do something, the system changes. So the system is changing regardless of what you do, but you don't want to go in and have an impact on it that causes a loss of evidence or something that might uh, taint the evidence and, and create opportunities for reasonable doubt or something like that if you find yourself in a courtroom situation. So again, the best answer here is that by sitting down at this computer and actually opening up a terminal and typing commands on it, that's a big negative. You don't want to do that. You're going to use your own tools um, coming from a read-only source to make sure that you don't go in and cause yourself any issues with that. Um, super cool uh, article down below. It's an RFC. I'm going to give that a quick read. It's brief and contains a lot of really uh, basic and fundamental information when you're talking about doing computer forensic investigations. Okay, here comes question number two today. Uh, what you got here is you got a developer who works at your organization who has written a script that goes in and changes a value, a numeric value in a field, just prior to it being used by another program as part of uh, its calculations. And then after the value has been read by the legitimate program, this user's malicious script goes in and sets the value back to its original value. My question to you is, is what is this an example of? Here's your answer choices. Give it some thought, click pause if you need to. When you're ready, click play and we'll break it all down. All right, first choice on the list is hacking. Um, 
I suppose if you really wanted to pound on it, you could probably try and go in and justify that as somehow being an answer. But uh, no, um, something that incredibly broad and ambiguous in terms of what a hacker is, is, uh, is, is probably not the best answer. So why don't we keep looking to see if we find something cooler than that. All right, the next answer choice goes in and says salami slicing, sounding delicious, but not the right answer. Salami slicing, which is usually associated with, with money and numbers, is when you take fractions of a penny or small values and you, you modify them or, or slice them off, as, it, as the case may be. Um, the single best examples, even though salami slicing is not that uncommon, just for the general population, the single best examples that are out there are A, Richard Pryor and Superman 3. And B, office space. Okay. If you haven't seen either of those, you'll probably be okay if you live the rest of your life and never see Superman 3, but office space is a must watch. So you gotta have that. All right, next batter up is time of check versus time of use errors. Uh, no, this is not the correct answer. Time of check versus time of use would imply that the value was read and then later on used before being checked again. In this case, the value is being changed and then read and used and then changed back again. So it's not a time of check versus time of use error. Next contender on the list is polyinstantiation. This is not the right answer. Polyinstantiation, uh, in the case of databases, which is where you most commonly are gonna see it referenced in the CISSP curriculum, is typically associated with the idea that a table contains multiple rows that have the same primary key, but some other value, usually some sort of a security label um, that determines uh, in who's allowed to go in and see what data in, in a particular row. And so you have two rows basically contain very similar values and yet some of them might be different because you're gonna let different people see it based on different levels of, of uh, clearance for doing that. But none of that has anything to do with, um, uh, with this question here. So don't worry about it. And then finally we come to the answer that we're looking for which is data diddling. Data diddling is the idea of going in and making changes to data. Um, it's very frequently in our discussions associated with the idea of doing it with a computer, but you can diddle data in the paper-based form and you can do it in a digital form as well. But again, the idea here is that you're gonna go in, you're gonna make a change to the data, and then the data is going to be read and you're going to change it back again or you may not change it back again depending upon how you're diddling. But uh, that's what the definition of data diddling is, is to go in and typically make some sort of a modification to data. And in our particular instance, that we are, we're changing it um, from a, a known good value to a bad value, letting that value be used in some way, shape, or form, and then changing it back again in an effort to hide um, the, the, the evidence that the, that the change had been made. So that's data diddling. All right, there we go. Two more questions down. Hope you dug them. The first question today was on really how do you just terribly mess up in a, doing a computer forensic investigation by going and actually using the commands on the actual system. And then the other question was simply making sure that you know and feel good about the definition of data diddling because uh, you're almost certain to encounter that in some way, shape, or form when you go to take the CISSP exam. So that's it. Appreciate you being here. See you tomorrow.